Hi everyone, this is Mrs. White, and welcome to this lecture on the Cardiovascular System Assessment. All right, we're going to start our lecture with looking at the different parts of the heart. Uh, the heart is composed of four chambers, two atria, two ventricles, left and right side. The heart is also composed of three layers of tissues. We have the endocardium, which is the inner layer, the myocardium, which is the muscular layer in the center, and the epicardium, which is the outer protective layer of the heart. We also have the pericardium, which surrounds this, the heart and the pericardial space in between, which is filled with pericardial fluid. Of note and of clinical significance is the fact that the left ventricle is two to three times thicker than the right. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why would we do that? It's because the left ventricle is tasked with providing oxygen and blood rich oxi uh, I'm sorry, oxygen rich blood to the body. So it has to be stronger to get the job done. Now, blood flows through the heart, uh, enters the right side from the rest of the body, from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle, which it then goes into the pulmonic vein. I'm sorry, the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery and then over to the lungs. In the lungs, we get a little razzle-dazzle, a little gas exchange. And from there, we now have oxygenated blood that is uh, picked up oxygen and offloaded the carbon dioxide that returns to the heart via the pulmonary veins. It enters the left atrium through the mitral valve to the left ventricle through the aortic valve and finally off to systemic circulation. So here's a look at where the heart valves are and you should become familiar with these valves and where to auscultate them because that's a very important part of being a nurse is being able to listen to the chest, the thoracic area at various points and understand what you're listening to. So you have the, uh, the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve, the pulmonic valve, and the uh, aortic, so also known as the semilunar valve. Now the heart needs oxygen just like any other organ, so it is uh, given oxygen via two major coronary arteries. We have the left coronary artery, or LCA, and that supplies blood over to the left atrium, the left ventricle, uh, the, sent the septum, and then part of the right ventricle. And then you have the right coronary artery branches that supply the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the back half, the posterior left ventricle. And the AV node and the bundle of his are, often, are also uh, taken care of by the RCA. And then the coronary veins drain into the coronary sinus where they uh, join circulation to go back. So if you look at this picture here, you can see the right and left coronary arteries as the major arteries and what they're feeding. And then you can see on the right-hand side, represented by blue, the cardiac veins that drain into the coronary sinus and go into the right atrium. All right, so what does the heart do? We know that it beats, and the question is, how does it beat? Well, the heart has its own conduction system, and we can uh, take a look at it here into this picture. So what you have is uh, that we have the SA node or sinoatrial node uh, heads on down to the AV node to the bundle of his down the left and right bundle branches to the Purkinje fibers and that's what finally gives us ventricular contraction. So you can see the SA node up here, AV node sitting right on top of the right ventricle down the left and right bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. All right, so there are different parts of the coronary 
conduction system, different time frames. One of them is uh, repolarization. So basically, um, you could see what that is here, contractile and conduction pathways. We gain resting polarized condition. And we have an absolute refractory period where the heart muscle does not respond at all. And then the relative refractory period where the heart muscle recovers excitability. Now, we are able to actually visualize the cardiac conduction system on an electrocardiogram, or ECG, sometimes EKG. And basically, it allows us to view the heart as letters, right? We've, we've assigned letters to them. And if you look down here at this next slide, you can see our P, Q, R, S, T. And then sometimes we have a U wave that's visual. The U wave is not always visual, visible. All right, so let's see what we have here. So the P wave represents the firing of the SA node and the depolarization of the atria. The QRS complex is the depolarization of the AV node throughout the ventricles. So that's the actual contraction of the ventricles. The T wave is repolarization of the ventricles. And the U wave, if we see it, sometimes we don't. Uh, we, that's the Purkinje fibers repolarizing. If we do see the U wave, sometimes it's because we uh, have hypokalemia. So keep that in mind. And the intervals between certain squiggles, if you will, have clinical significance for us. And we'll learn about that under our dysrhythmias, but in general, um, what the time is, is how long that signal takes to get from one area of the heart to the other. So we're very interested, for example, in how long does it take the atria to reach the ventricles, and how long does it take the ventricles to contract, and then how long does it take for the ventricles to then rest and repolarize because different disorders can cause changes in that, and those can be very dangerous. Some can just be annoying. Some can mean nothing at all, um, just maybe a result of medications. So the mechanical system, we talk about systole and diastole. And if you're asking yourself why that sounds a lot like systolic and diastolic blood pressure, you are absolutely right. So systole is when the heart muscles contract, and blood is ejected from the ventricles. And diastole is the relaxation of the heart. And recall that the relaxation allows the heart to fill up. This can be a big problem if our heart's beating too fast that it doesn't get time to relax so it doesn't fill. All right, so the stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected with each heartbeat. This should all be review. Stroke volume is one part of our cardiac output. Basically, it's the amount of blood pumped by the ventricle in a minute. So we take the stroke volume, multiply that by the heart rate, and there's your cardiac output. Normal is 4 to 8 liters per minute. There's something known as the cardiac index. I don't hang my hat on that an awful lot, but if you ever saw it, uh, basically it talks about cardiac output based on the size of the body. But again, in NCLEX land and others, we're more likely to be concerned about the cardiac output, meaning stroke volume times heart rate. All right, as we go down, uh, once again, talking about cardiac output, our heart rate is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. We learned that in times of need of perfusion, that our heart rate can increase, and at times of relaxation, the autonomic nervous system gives us the parasympathetic service, a system which tends to relax the heart rate. Some other factors that affect stroke volume is preload, right? The amount of blood that's actually available to be pumped out. Contractility, which is how hard the heart can pump, like with which force. And afterload, also known as systemic vascular resistance, or that force which the heart must overcome in order to pump blood to the rest of the body. Right, so there you have it. Preload, volume of blood stretching the ventricles. It's all about the fluid. There's something called Frank Starling Law, which says that the more stretch you have, 
you have more force of contraction. So one way I've always thought about that is if you have a bow and arrow, the further back you pull it, the, right, the larger amount of snap it gets and further your arrow can fly. All right, uh, contractility. Again, that's like how hard your heart is pumping. Sympathetic nervous system has a lot to do with this. When we have epinephrine and norepinephrine, that causes our hearts to increase the force with which they're pumping and then also the rate. And then afterload, right? So things that affect afterload might be the ventricle, how much the blood pressure is. And re remember that it says down here, and you can read it, but as we have chronically elevated blood pressure, that leads to more systemic vascular resistance, which is the harder the work, uh, the heart has to work to kind of overcome it. And the muscle becomes hypertrophic, the cardiac muscle. This is not good overall. And then cardiac reserve, right? So this is what we take for granted in many times. It is the ability for our cardiac output to increase in the response to some sort of situation with our health or illness. So people who are exercising to be able to bring that heart rate up and give us better output. People who experience stress and panic, right? Can your heart rate keep up? And in times of low volume, can the heart augment the way it's pumping and the rate to keep your blood pressure up? We can see this as compensatory to shock a lot of times. And um, others is just being healthy, right? So here's a question for you. Patients receiving a drug that decreases afterload, to evaluate the patient's response to this drug, what is the most important for the nurse to assess? You can pause and think about those answers, and when you're ready, press play again. All right, and here you have it. It is afterload. All right, so afterload is affected by the size of the ventricle, wall tension, systemic vascular resistance. All right, so now let's take a closer look at the vascular system, including the blood vessels, uh, which reside in the heart. So blood does circulate from the uh, left side of the heart using arteries and arterioles, except for the pulmonary artery, right? That's the only one in the body that kind of bucks the, uh, the rule here. We have capillaries, and then we have venules the right side of the heart. You can see here the difference between an artery and a vein. Arteries have thick muscular and elastic middle coat, and the veins tend to be thinner and a little bit wider, right? They don't have as much snap. So arteries have uh, thick walls of elastic tissue that feels the pressure. They re recoil, they push the blood forward, and large arteries like the aorta and the pulmonary artery, they also have some smooth muscle in them. The endothelium is the inner lining of the vessels. That's what holds the uh, homeostasis, promotes blood flow, inhibits coagulation. And any disruption of the endothelium can result in coagulation and a clot. Capillaries are a thin wall of endothelial tissue. They don't actually have elastic or muscle tissue, and they connect arterioles and venules together, and it helps exchange nutrients and those metabolic end products. Remember our veins, they're thin walled, large diameter, low pressure, high volume. They have valves to help move the blood toward the heart. So some things that affect the amount of blood in the venous system would be the arterial flow, the compression of the vessels, uh, any change in thoracic or abdominal pressures, right atrial pressure. So increased right atrial pressure would ex uh, affect the SVC. So we might see, uh, so that's superior vena cava, we might see distended neck veins. The inferior vena cava, we would see liver engorgement, right, as we look and see what's backing up. Right, let's talk about some of the regulation. All right, so the autonomic nervous system is constantly looking around. It's checking the body, making sure that we have sustained adequate blood pressure. 
Remember, the sympathetic nervous system can increase the heart rate, increase the rate, increase contractility. Parasympathetic tends to slow that down, slows the conduction, and that's the vagus nerve. We have baroreceptors and chemoreceptors that are constantly looking at our carbon dioxide levels and adjusting our respiratory rate in turn. A lot of our barrel receptors are at the aortic arch and the carotid sinus, and they are sensitive to stretch or pressure in the atrial system. All right, so what else do we have here? We have blood pressure. So blood pressure is defined as the, pr the pressure that's exerted by the blood on the arterial walls. It's something that we measure. So we look at the systolic blood pressure. Uh, normal would be less than 120. And diastolic is uh, basically the second sound we hear when we listen to a blood pressure, and normal would be less than 80. So remember some things that affect our blood pressure are cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. Now we have all different ways that we can measure a blood pressure. Uh, we can do it invasively using things like uh, arterial lines uh, that are attached to a transducer. We might do something non-invasive. This is the one that you guys are all familiar with, our sphygmomanometer and the stethoscope, so the blood pressure cuff. So important in order to get the right uh, blood pressure reading, you must use the correct size and the correct positioning. So ask yourself, how should the patient be positioned to get a good blood pressure? Hopefully you know the answer to that. If you can't spit it out right now, then I want you to go back to your textbooks and take a look at how to measure blood pressure. And the sounds that we hear are called uh, Korokoff sounds. So the first and the fifth. So the first sound is the systolic, and when the sound disappears, that is the diastolic. So we can use that good old fashion blood pressure and stethoscope, or we might also use an automated device, which we see a lot of times in the hospitals now, and even in outpatients and nursing homes. All right, so we've got the pulse pressure and the mean arterial pressure. So the pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. That's especially important to us because there are times that, based on what's happening with the person's body, we might see a narrowing or a widening pulse pressure. But the normal pulse pressure is about third of the systolic blood pressure. And then we have the mean arterial pressure. Remember, that's as easy as one, two, three, one systolic plus two diastolic, all divided by three. So we uh, target a map of 65, but we will accept 60 or better to make sure we are perfusing those vital organs. All right, so let's talk about the old folks, right? So the risk of cardiovascular disease definitely increases with age. We have um, increased coronary artery disease. That is your most common problem, and that is due to atherosclerosis. Right, so cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in adults who are over the age of 65. And these changes can be a result of aging, disease, environmental factors, and lifetime behaviors that uh, now are starting to catch up with the patient. So some of the things that happen, um, you can look on this slide when we get older, is that we have uh, increased collagen, decreased elastin, so that leads to kind of um, enlargement of the heart, hypertrophy. They have a harder time recovering their heart rate, so they have a decreased response to stress. They end up with uh, more murmurs because those valves are thick and stiff. And they also lose their pacemaker cells. The number decreases, so it's more likely that a person would uh, be older to ha and have a dysrhythmia than if they were younger. And then also our beta adrenergic receptors. So this means that they have a decreased stress response, right? As if it isn't already a problem, um, we add medications into the mix. Some of the other things that happen, let me move this little lady over here so it's a little smaller so you can see. Oops, let me put her down there. All right, perfect. Uh, the blood vessels thicken, they're more uh, less elastic, so you end up with increased blood pressures. Uh, so increase in the systolic, but really no change in the diastolic. 
Uh, they end up with incompetent valves in their lower extremities, especially we see that in the way of edema and sometimes even venous stasis. They have orthostasis, so they're going to uh, have trouble when they get up. They might be more prone to falling and fall risk for hypotension. They have postprandial hypotension. So after they eat, their pressure drops, and that gives them an increased risk of falls. And also kyphosis, right? So look at this little lady with her curved back and what that effect might be on the vascular system of the, of the heart. All right, so now we're going to move right along to assessment. So under our physical exam, you want to take a look at how does your patient look? Do they look like they're perfusing well? Are they... Um, dressed appropriately? Are they sweating? Are they not? Uh, you want to look at all those signs of perfusion we have and how they look overall. Are they well? Looking at the vital signs, um, get their blood pressure, and you might also need to check their postural blood pressure and heart rate to check for orthostatic changes. Inspection, uh, we want to look at skin color. We want to make sure that they're at their baseline for their uh, for their ethnic division. Make sure they have good hair growth. Remember, uh, hair distribution would be uneven in times and areas where we have uh, decreased arterial, uh, decreased ar arterial supply. We're going to look for any venous changes, looking for any edema, look at their fingers for clubbing, for chronic hypoxia, any lesions. Definitely look for JVD. So one thing to note when you're looking at JVD is that your person actually has to be sitting in the correct manner, right? They have to be 30 to 45 degree angle because if anybody's laying flat, the J JVD is common finding when they're flat. It's really not clinically significant. Right, JVD can also happen if a person does the Valsalva maneuver. So basically, you want to make sure they're positioned correctly. And under palpation, we're going to be looking at the temperature of the skin. Is it warm? Is it moist? Looking at edema, pressing your fingers down, your pulses. And we want to check where they're at. And those are the arteries, and we grade them basically zero for absent to three plus for bounding. So normal is two. We look for their capillary refill and brewy. Right, and under our vital signs, we're looking for, um, we would look for something like a pulse deficit. A pulse deficit is the difference between getting their apical and radial at the same time. And if there is a pulse deficit, meaning that you hear more beats than there are transmitted to the radial artery, then there could be a cardiac dysrhythmia, and therefore we might to have them on cardiac monitoring. All right, so here's where we uh, look for all of our arteries, the carotid, brachial, radial, ulnar. Uh, we don't generally check ulnar pulses, so you'd want to focus on radial, ephemeral, popliteal, PT, and DP. So even though the posterior tibial pulse, you almost want to wrap your hand around and go on the outside of the foot. Guys, it's in the medial malleolus, so you definitely want to make sure that you are on the inside of the leg behind the ankle bone. Okay, so medial malleolus. All right, and here are our landmarks uh, for listening to our heart sounds. where we find our aortic valve listening, pulmonic, herbs point, the tricuspid area, and then the mitral area, which is the apex and the point of maximal impulse. I always remember this by um, All People Enjoy Time magazine. So the aortic, pulmonic, herbs point, tricuspid, and then mitral. So the PMI should be felt at the intersection of the fifth intercostal space and the left midclavicular line. If we find it elsewhere, outside of those landmarks, it would indicate potential cardiac enlargement, which we might see in something like LVH or left ventricular hypertrophy. So 
anytime that that PMI is outside of where we think it's going to be, it could be an enlarged heart. All right, so under the thorax, you definitely want to do your inspection and palpation. And remember, it's all people enjoy Time Magazine. We're going to be listening through for basically any abnormal thrills, brewies. The abdominal aorta is in the epigastric area. And what we're doing is we're looking for visible pulsations. Now, you have to look at the body habitus of your patient. So if somebody is thin, it's very common that we might see that visible pulsation. And if so, if they're very thin, that would be basically normal under our assessment. But um, unless there's any other abnormal findings, things like brewing pain or hypotension with the pulsation, then again, it's, it's a rather normal finding in our thin individuals, right? Because their aorta is closer to the skin surface. All right. Looking at our heart sounds, right? So S1 is the closure of the tricuspid and mitral valves. It's that lub-dub sound. So it's the lub of the lub-dub. S2 is the closing of the aortic and pulmonic valves, which is uh, the dub sound. And you do need to listen in sequence, right? Using the diaphragm. And the current 11th edition of the Lewis textbook, that is diagram 31.7, so remember our pulse deficit, palpate the radial pulse, listen to the apical, they should match. If they don't, you could have a dysrhythmia. All right, so some of the other rhythms that you might have, uh, I'm gonna just switch up here for a minute. We have the um, split S2, uh, S3 and S4, so remember, um, S3 and S4 are best heard with the bell. Also best heard with the bell would be any of our gallop rhythms, so, because they're low-pitched as well. If we're looking for split sounds that are associated with mitral valve, then it's best to turn our patient onto the left side because that brings the heart closer to the chest wall. So again, depending on what you're listening to, whether it's um, a high pitch like S1 and S2, you'd want to use the diaphragm, and low pitched, you would want to use the bell. All right, and this is just a picture of when we have the echocardiogram, what those looked up sounds are, All right? So S1 is in the QRS, and so lup, and the dub is after the ventricle spill, right? All right, some of the additional sounds that you might hear might be murmurs. All right, so anytime you hear an abnormal sound, which you think might be a murmur, you want to be able to tag it by timing, location, and what position the patient is in. Sometimes you might hear a brewery. So a brewery is a sound created by turbulent blood flow in the artery. Thrills are those palpable ones, right? So think about an AV fistula where we could um, hear the brewery but feel the thrill. So a murmur is a sound that's caused by turbulent blood flow through the heart. It could be due to a damaged valve. So remember, we want to make sure we know what position the murmur is heard best. So example, if you're sitting and leaning forward, or the timing of the murmur in relation to the cardiac cycle. For example, is it a systolic or a diastolic murmur? And where on the thorax the murmur is heard best? So that's what we're looking for. Now, in the case of pericarditis, this is due to the inflamed pericardium moving against each other. Um, and the best way to listen to this is at the apex with the patient upright, leaning forward, and holding their breath. So on the subject of murmurs, here is the areas that you are going to hear murmurs. So all people enjoy Time Magazine, do it in order, um, and the different causes that we could see. Right, so if you hear an aortic murmur, it could be from the aortic valve, so aortic stenosis. Pulmonic, 
could be due to an atrial septal defect or pulmonic stenosis. Tricuspid um, it could be either holocystic or systolic or diastolic. Uh, herb point, whether it's systolic or diastolic, and then the mitral area. So again, this is from osmosis, that picture. So we put them for that. All right, so diagnostic studies of the heart. One of the most common is the troponins, and depending on where you're at, you might use troponin 1, troponin 2, troponin T. But what we know is that uh, cardiac troponins start to elevate four to six hours after myocardial injury, and they are highly specific to the myocardium. So they are the preferred diagnostic marker for any myocardial infarction. Now, myoglobin does rise in response to myocardial injury within 30 to 60 minutes, but it's rapidly cleared from the body, and this makes it not really the best to use. Creatinine kinase, um, there are three different types of them, and the one that's specific to the heart is called CKMB, and that increases, um, you know, within three to six hours after the infarction, and then it also peaks. So we often trend the CKMB along with the troponins. Homocysteine levels, uh, as we look at some of the additional studies, basically that gives us increased risk of cardiovascular disease and also the CRP. Some of the other blood studies we might do would be those peptide markers that help us look for um, indications of heart failure. So the BNP is specific for heart failure for us. For cardiac workups, we also, we also want to look at the lipid panel. And we have triglycerides, cholesterol, and phospholipids, and then lipoproteins. So you should go take a look at the lipids, look at the normals, um, the difference between HDL and LDL. And I remember that because we want higher HDL to decrease our cardiovascular risk, and we want lower LDL. All right, so let's try a question. Patient arrives at the urgent care center after experiencing unrelenting substernal and epigastric pain and pressure for about 12 hours. We review the labs. Uh, with the understanding that at this point in time, a myocardial infarction would be indicated by peak levels of what? The answer is troponin, right? It's the marker of choice for uh, cardiac damage. They peak at 10 to 24 hours. All right, some cardiac monitoring that you would be responsible for. Uh, electrocardium, that's a one-time look. It's like taking a snapshot of the heart, and you can see where the figures are found in your textbook. Again, that's a one-time picture, but uh, unless the person's having the dysrhythmia at that time, we might not pick it up. So for some folks, they need an event monitor or a loop recorder. So external would be things like Holter monitors, event monitors, and then we even have internal for sometimes serious infrequent dysrhythmias. So basically, uh, those are implanted, or it's implanted in an office session, it's very easy. And um, basically, it starts to do a continuous monitor when the heart rate increases or decreases. So in our Holter monitors, we wanna make sure our patients know to keep a diary describing what's happening um, to basically correlate any sort of rhythm disturbance to their activities. We don't let the patients take a shower or bath during the Holter monitor um, in general, but they do have new ones that kind of go on the skin that they can have a bath with, but they should continue all other daily activities, so it depends on the type they have. And again, this is just a picture again of the electrocardiogram our P, Q, R, S, T, and sometimes U wave, so take a peek at that. Imaging, um, chest x-ray, CT, MRI. Remember, an MRI is contraindicated for any patients with implantable metallic devices, like a pacemaker. 
echocardiogram. It's a non-invasive test that has us uh, taking a look at the structures and function of the heart. This is how we get our measures of ejection fraction, right? That is the amount of blood ejected during each beat. It looks at motion wall, uh, relationship of the structures. We could even get color flow, which I'll show you on this one here. See, here's color flow. Let's us see how the blood's actually moving through. Some other tests that the patient might have to undergo would be like the stress echo. Basically, it could be an exercise or non-exercise test. And any time we start to have any sort of dysrhythmia with a stress echo, we want to make sure it stops. We might do a transesophageal echo. Now for that, they're actually going down through the esophagus. And remember that a person who is undergoing that sort of procedure would need to be NPO for six to eight hours before and check the gag reflux after before you feed them, right? So we prefer to look at T's because think how close the heart is to the esophagus. All right, so uh, looking at the CT, you might use a CTA, which um, is non-invasive, so just injecting dye through regular IV, versus the calcium scoring screening, which is also very non-invasive. So just to look at those to see what we're looking at. The uh, MUGA scan, which we don't do that often, stress perfusion imaging. So basically, that's when they um, basically have the person The one I'm most familiar with is when the person exercises and they click it on the table and do a, a, an echo at the time, like a stress echo. If they can't exercise, we give medications to sort of mimic it. Cardiac cath is invasive, all right? So these are the ones if somebody's having a STEMI or something that they need to go to cardiac cath, or perhaps they have a cardiac cath because they're, they're coming in with other problems, so those are more non-urgent, we schedule them as normally outpatients. Um, they're usually divided into right-sided and left-sided. Right-sided heart cats are usually pretty diagnostic. They just are looking for things. We're left-sided, um, we often are doing interventions in the left side of the heart. So remember, it's invasive. It goes through an artery. Uh, usually the femoral, but it can be radial, it can be brachial. So following cath uh, cardiac catheterization, we need to be on the lookout for bleeding. Bleeding, right? That would be our, our big killer. Um, person could be allergic to the contrast, and when they do get contrast, we should let them know that it's going to feel warm. It's normal. Um, lots of problems, but again, in the first 24 hours after, it's going to be bleeding. So our, our process for this. Uh, Pre-procedure to assess any allergies, make sure they're not allergic to contrast dye, get their vitals, make sure they're nothing by mouth. They are awake during the procedure, but they do get local anesthesia. Make sure their labs are good. They may get some sedation medication, but they are not unconscious, right? They might just get uh, something to help them relax. And post-procedure, you want to definitely look at um, how they were doing to before. Look for signs of PE. Depending on which artery they went into, you're going to have to do a good vascular assessment distal. All right. And uh, make sure the patient understands their discharge instructions and what they can and can't do. All right. Last question, I believe. So patient returns to the cardiac observation area following a cardiac cath with a coronary angiography. So which assessment would require immediate action by the nurse? Hopefully you all said an ST segment elevation because that indicates myocardial ischemia or injury with either a partial or total occlusion of the coronary artery.
this would require immediate action. These actions would be looking for an assessment of chest pain, getting a 12 lead EKG, possibly nitro or morphine, notifying the healthcare provider. Option A would need further assessment, but it's not critical unless the patient's symptomatic, meaning they have chest pain, shortness of breath. Uh, B and D are normal findings, so do not be led astray. Okay, everyone, so that's the end of this. So I want to say thank you very much for watching. Let me put this on here. Thank you. All right, if you like what we're doing, so hit the like button and maybe give me a subscribe so that I can grow my channel just a little bit. I can't even write subscribe, subscribe. And remember, this is Mrs. White. I'm a nursing professor and I love what I do. Thanks a lot, guys. I hope you have a great day.